The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on EVECT effective patient monitoring strategies, when, who, what, and how. In these days of health crisis, when online meetings have becoming the preferred means of communication for all, I'm Dominique Piero, Science Manager at, at IOF. I'm very happy to moderate this webinar. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your questions into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. I will voice the questions to the speaker towards the end of this webinar. This being said, I am happy to introduce our speaker of the day, Professor Thierry Thomas. Professor Thomas is Professor of Medicine and Head of the Rheumatology Department at the University Hospital in Saint-Étienne, France, and a member of the Laboratory of Integrative Biology of Bone Tissue. He is an active member of the IOF Steering Committee running the global program Capture the Fracture for Secondary Fracture Prevention, and as such, the recognized expert to talk about effective patient monitoring strategy in this context. Professor Thomas, please, we are listening to your presentation. Hello, uh, thank you, um, Dominique, for this uh, introduction. Um, uh, as, as you said, uh, we will talk about um, uh, patient uh, monitoring, uh, especially in the context of uh, uh, fractural lesion uh, services. And I hope uh, you'll enjoy speaking about something different than COVID uh, for about uh, one hour. As, as you see in, in, in this uh, first uh, title slide, uh, I am from France, from the uh, Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes area. Usually uh, we don't pay attention to that, but because we are in a webinar, I think it's a good opportunity to share uh, experiences uh, around the world and especially what we are currently doing in, in France. So you'll see uh, in, in the presentation um, specific guidelines from, from France and, and data uh, or organization of uh, FLSs that uh, come from, from France. I, I think it's useful for everyone to, to share uh, their own uh, experiences. Here are my uh, disclosure. So I would split the, the, the talk between when, who, what, and how uh, questions. But um, honestly, it's a little bit uh, arbitrary. Uh, and you'll see that uh, um, these four different uh, subtitles of the presentation uh, can be uh, overlapping uh, with one uh, with uh, the others. You'll see also for each, each uh, subtitle that I made references to the subtitle and the best practice uh, framework standards um, that uh, the uh, Capture the Fracture program has uh, set up, especially for the questionnaires you can apply for or you already apply for if you run a, an FLS and we can make then uh, audit of your uh, FLS. So this first question is about identification, evaluation, and timing uh, in terms of uh, patient uh, monitoring when they had uh, their first uh, fracture. So um, in this context and in this clinical situation, everything usually starts in the uh, emergency uh, room. This is a picture of uh, the entrance of uh, our ER here in our uh, university hospital. It's, it's in French, but the, the color is usually uh, uh, the same worldwide. So 
it's the first uh, red step for someone having a, a fracture is coming with uh, help to the uh, ER. And then the next step is the what we could call the, the blue room after the red, the red room. So it's the uh, operating room uh, for the fracture that uh, of course uh, needs surgery. And then uh, that's the uh, where the uh, FLS uh, really uh, uh, starts. And that's a pathway for uh, a patient having in mind that um, the hospital that could be a private or um, a public hospital has the um, uh, human resources uh, to um, manage the patient uh, coming from the emergency room or the orthopedic department and then to assess his uh, bone status and everything that has to be done by um, a fracture, a fracture uh, liaison uh, service. Uh, we currently admit that all patients that are um, above 50 with a clinical uh, non-vertebral fracture or a clinical fracture that would arrive in a hospital through the ER or the uh, OR should then go through the um, FLS, and that's the key, one of the key role of the uh, uh, FLS coordinator to identify all these patients. So that's a very important first step, is this first step of uh, identification. It doesn't mean that the FLS will uh, eventually uh, visit the patient, but it is a, a a key information to have the um, knowledge of all the patients are, that are managed uh, within the institution for this kind of, uh, of fractures. In addition to this patient with clinical fracture, either vert vertebral or non-vertebral fractures, then uh, an optimal FLS should also be able to um, identify patient that um, come to the uh, radiology department and have um, x-ray or CT or MRI for any reason and um, these exams give the opportunity to discover uh, fortuitously um, uh, vertebral fractures. This is probably one part of the EFLSs around the world that has to be uh, improved. And we all consider that um, um, artificial uh, in intelligence and uh, electronical uh, records of, of um, data throughout the institution will add the, um, the coordinator to um, uh, identify these, these patients co coming from the radiology uh, department. So first step, uh, very important identification. And then the second major role of the coordinator is then to contact the patient either uh, as inpatient or uh, as uh, outpatient after they uh, they leave the uh, the hospital um, to um, give them uh, appointment for uh, uh, DXA um, measurement uh, bone specialist uh, visit uh, and so on. That's that's very important. For example, in our um, FLS here in in our um, uh, department, uh, our coordinator uh, actually contacts twice the patient. Uh, uh, the first contact is uh, through mailing, and then is there is a second contact through uh, phoning to be sure that they, the, the patient will um, attend the, uh, the uh, FLS uh, visit. Uh, 
I have to say, in our own experience here in, in France, uh, we have a lot of difficulties to see the patient within the time frame they are in the uh, auto orthopedic de department if they are not treated as uh, outpatient but rather as inpatient. This this uh, stay in the um, um, orthopedic ward is usually about four to five days. Uh, patients are usually painful because of the uh, surgery and, and the fracture. Uh, they are sometimes a little bit confused by what happens to them and uh, it's difficult to um, uh, convince them to come to the um, to our department and to uh, have all the uh, exam needed for um, osteoporosis uh, uh, evaluation and it also it's also quite difficult to convince the, the the family so in our experience it's easier to see um, the patient in a couple of weeks after their stay in the uh, orthopedic uh, ward. Th then um, the additional role of uh, the coordinator, at least, at least it is the case in, in our uh, departments, is to be sure that all the data collected for each patient are then in, in a, a local uh, database, then we can share them with uh, other um, hospitals. In France, it is mandatory that it is a patient, in a um, 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 doctor, sorry, that visits the patient uh and um uh, prescribe the uh, the the treatment i know it is not the case in all countries but here it it is uh, mandatory and it's of course a problem because the uh uh resources in terms of uh md's are uh, uh, quite limited so um it, it's um, always um, a challenge for us to have uh, enough uh, medical resources to visit all patients visiting the uh, FLS. What is really important then after the, 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 the um, um, bone specialist um, doctor has visited the patient is to then coordinate the pathway of the, the, um, the, the, the patient with the GP um to be sure that uh, treatment initiation that is started during uh, the visit in our uh, FLS it is then uh, prescribed again by the GP and that the follow-up and I will come back to that is uh, well uh, managed uh, by most of the time the GP and sometime our uh, FLS it's also the one of the um, um, uh, physician uh, duty to get in contact with the fall prevention uh, um, department if the patient needs some um, precise uh, assessment of his uh, risk of falls and uh, even more if uh, the patient uh, needs um, um, treatment uh, for that. So that's the optimal uh, organization within one uh, hospital. And I figure here in these slides, the many FLSs that have been uh, mapped in the capture the fracture uh, framework. But it's a quite a large um, uh, map. And if you focus on this little area of France, that is uh, the the area where I live and, and, and work, you can see that actually there's only uh, three FLSs. Then if I uh, put that in perspective with all the public and private hospitals that do manage patients with fragility fracture in this area that is about 500 kilometer uh, wide. 
from east to uh, to to west, you see that these uh, number of hospitals are uh, um, uh, tremendously high, and we are far from uh, solving the problem of managing a patient with fragility fracture for preventing their uh, second fracture just with the three FLSs that actually are only in big uh, in institution. Um, uh, indeed, it is the uh, three university hospitals um, uh, of this um, area. So we have to keep in mind this, uh, this clear gap between the number of hospitals and the number of um, uh, currently uh, uh, running um, FLSEs. And we have to think of other organizations that could uh, provide additional help in the management of this uh, patient, especially in uh, the private uh, practice uh, setting. And I'll give you two examples of um, solutions that have been uh, developed in France to be combined with um, FLS, FLSEs. The first program is an interesting program. It's called um, Prado, and it, it's a program that is um, run by the uh, so social security um, as an agency, so the, the organization that pays for uh, everything in, in terms of, of um, medical uh, health in, in, in France. And what the social security uh, does is that they have uh, employees that are um, visiting the different um, uh, orthopedic uh, wards, not only for a patient with fragility fracture, but also for a patient that uh, are here for uh, arthroplasty, for example. And um, if the patient agrees, then the uh, social security uh, employee will help the patient to get um, um, uh, GP uh, um, visit uh, uh, appointment after he leaves the hospital. He can get also uh, appointments with other uh, healthcare uh, professional like uh, uh, physiotherapist. He can also provide appointment for uh, the exa measurement in case of uh, fragility uh, fracture. So. Uh, theoretically, it's it's quite an interesting um, organization because these uh, employees from the social security can visit all kind of uh, different uh, hospital, public or private, large hospital or even small uh, uh, clinics. One of the uh, the pitfall of this system is that it 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 has to be. Uh, the um, um, the medical team that manage the uh, patient that has to promote the program and ask the patient if he uh, agrees to be uh, visited by the uh, social security employees. And uh, while it is well done for um, uh, organized um, visit. Uh, to the uh, hospital for uh, astroplasty, for example. When it is uh, for uh, fragility fractures, um, it is not as well um, picked up by the, um, the medical teams. And um, we have some hope for um, improvement in, in this program, but so far the um, the success of the program is not uh, fully uh, there. Another more uh, recent um, um, solution uh, has been promoted by the uh, Ministry of uh, Health and we have been uh, working with the Ministry for uh, putting that uh, together. And the idea is to um, have a kind of a, a NFLS that is outside the walls of 
the uh, hospital and an FLS that is embedded in a GP uh, network uh, organization that um, is now uh, mandatory for uh, GPs in different uh, areas. So instead of, of having a FLS coordinator, it is now the GP network coordinator that will um, organize the pathway of the patient um, between the uh, hospital and the orthopedic surgeon and the GP, sometimes the bone specialist, and uh, all the health uh, care professionals that will have to manage uh, the, um, the, the patient for DEXA treatment initiation and follow-up and, and, uh, and so on. So it's a pilot um, organization, but it's certainly something that could be very uh, helpful because the general practitioner are, are really part of the um, network uh, um, organization. And um, in areas where there is very few hospital, no uh, specialist, um, it is certainly something we have to uh, keep in, in, in mind in terms of uh, alternative um, FLS. The next um, uh, point uh, is uh, who should be uh, managed by the uh, uh, FLS and how the um, FLS and the healthcare professionals working in the FLS have to deal with the uh, risk of uh, future fracture uh, for this uh, specific patient. And this referred to standard five to seven of the BFF assessment guidelines, fall prevention and, and so on. Um, as, as you know, there are probably four very important key factor risks that have to be uh, evaluated by uh, the physician or the um, uh, healthcare professional that visits the patient uh, in, in the FLS. It's age, the risk of fall, especially for patients over 70, uh, the previous uh, fracture, and it's recency, and of course, that is uh, very obvious for someone that visit the patient, uh, for someone that visit the FLS um, after coming to hospital for a fracture. And the, the fourth key factor is uh, BMD um, uh, assessment. Age, just one slide to remind you that, um, of course, the risk of fracture increases with uh, age. And I show you here the population pyramid of patients hospitalized in France for a, a fracture. It was in 2013. And you can see on, on the left the hospitalization for hip fractures and, and on the right hospitalization for waist fractures. And uh, of course, as, as you know, the in increase in uh, hospitalization for hip uh, is uh, above the age of uh, 75, roughly, uh, while for wrist is uh, right after 50. You can see also in this slide that uh, it is still a predominantly um, a clinical situation that um, is a concern for women. In France, it's, the ratio is 75% of hospitalization um, that are um, for uh, women compared to uh, 25 for, for men. And you can also see the difference between hip fracture where you can uh, easily uh, consider that all hip fracture more or less are related to um, uh, fragility um, um, fractures. There are very, very few uh, uh, hip fracture before the age of uh, 70. Whereas for other fractures like the wrist or like the ankle, there are definitely uh, some 
background situation of traumatic wrist fracture and we have to keep that uh, in mind because this part of um, uh, traumatic wrist fracture is still there up to the age of at least uh, 70. Then uh, we definitely have to uh, assess the risk of uh, falls. Most of the uh, non vertebral fractures uh, occur uh, after uh, a fall from uh, patients' uh, height. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's also true for uh, vertebral fractures um, as well. So we have to carefully uh, assess this risk of uh, fall. And the very first question to ask is whether the, 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 there was a previous fall in, in the last uh, th three to uh, six months. If it is the case, it is someone that definitely needs to visit uh, a fall prevention uh, service. In the absence of previous fall, and as most of the patients say that they uh, uh, fall because they didn't pay attention and they minimize the, this problem of fall, you have to make some tests. Um, and one of the best is probably the get up and, and go test. So you have also the uh, unipodal test or the standard push test. But to be honest, um, in clinical practice, those tests are usually not easy to perform for someone that had a fracture and most of the time surgery in the last uh, couple of weeks, having in mind that the target we want to achieve is to visit the patient in the eight to 12 weeks following uh, fr fracture uh, event. So it's not always easy to, um, to evaluate that. But on the other hand, um, fall prevention services um, is very time demanding for uh, uh, accurately evaluating the patient. And um, there is very often a lack of um, resources and you have to make some uh, adjustment um, to uh, determine if a patient needs or not to visit the fall prevention uh, service. At least it is the case in our um, hospital, even though there is really a very good fall prevention service that is able to provide both accurate assessment of this um, uh, fall risk and then to provide as well uh, intervention uh, program. So it's very important to do that, but it's uh, really demanding in terms of uh, human uh, resources. Then, um, uh, and I already mentioned that, one of the um, key issue in uh, appropriate patient um, uh, management is to be able to evaluate the risk of a future fracture and to initiate um, uh, anti-osteoporotic uh, uh, treatment if needed in a very short period of time because as you know the risk of having a, a second fracture is very high in the um, uh, time frame of two years following the, uh, the, the first fra uh, fracture. It is true for uh, the second hip fracture after having the first one. I show you here uh, uh, quite a uh, old paper. It's already uh, 15 years ago, but uh, the, uh, the data are still uh, true. Uh, if you focus on, on the uh, right hand uh, graph, you can see that 50% of the, um, the second fracture will occur uh, within this uh, two year uh, time frame. And we have more recent data that are interesting because they are um, um, more uh, general concept of 
uh, imminent risk of uh, fracture for someone that got his first major osteoporotic fracture, regardless of the uh, um, bone location. The risk of having uh, his second major osteoporotic fracture, again, regardless of the bone site, is very important in the two years following the first uh, event. This is data coming from a very large cohort in uh, Iceland. You have here at the bottom the uh, uh, normal risk of fracture for someone uh, 75 years old with no uh, uh, fracture. And you have the risk here of someone that got his first uh, major osteoporotic uh, fracture. Of course, the risk remains higher in this group for the anterior uh, follow-up of the, uh, the, the, the study and the publication, but you can see again that the, there is a major uh, over-risk of uh, this uh, second fracture in this short period of time. So having in mind that most of the treatments require at least six to 12 months to reduce the risk of vertebral fracture, and uh, mainly around uh, 18 months to reduce the risk of non-vertebral fractures, especially the second hip fracture. There is some um, uh, urgent need to uh, initiate the treatment if the treatment uh, is, uh, is needed. And there is also one other um, um, component that uh, is in the uh, equation because this patient are uh, often uh, old patients, they are frail, there is the uh, competing risk uh, of mortality, and this is well uh, demonstrated in this uh, graph. If you have patient, a patient that is 70, his risk of having a second major osteoporotic fracture is higher at, after six months of follow-up compared to uh, uh, 24 months and then to 60 months. It's also true I uh, 80, but then it's tremendously different uh, at, at the age of, uh, of 90, because then these uh, patients um, have a very high risk of uh, mortality. And if the uh, follow-up increases, of course, the risk of death is um, much uh, higher and they have no time to uh, have a, a, a second fracture. So we have to play in, in this very uh, short uh, period of time to reduce this um, risk of uh, second uh, fracture. Because even if the patient is uh, quite old, it's always a benefit for the patient for preventing uh, a second fracture that is, uh, of course, uh, a very uh, a painful uh, event uh, and that is uh, uh, very uh, damaging for his uh, quality of life. And this, um, what is interesting in this risk of um, mortality is that um, it is still there, even though um, um, patients are now living uh, in uh, healthier conditions uh, for a, a longer uh, period. And in, in this data coming from the Jibo uh, uh, study in, in, um, uh, in Australia, they compare two subgroup of their, uh, of their uh, very large uh, cohort. And what is uh, very striking is that Comparing those that were born before uh, 1930 and, th and those after uh, 1930, uh, they demonstrated that uh, when fractures uh, uh, occur, then the risk of mortality after, after these um, events, it is true for hip, it is true for uh, vert fractures, it is true or actually for all fractures, the risk of mortality is quite the same. So it it um, remains um, uh, it, the the um, the idea that um, 
um, osteoporosis is, is part of the uh, general uh, frailty of, of the patients. And when a fracture occurs, uh, it, uh, it is the witness of a global uh, frailty of, of those um, patients. I, I, I touch a little bit about age, then falls, and the and then the problem of um, the previous fracture and the um, uh, imminent risk of second, uh, second fractures and the competing problem of the risk of mortality. The fourth key um, um, uh, factor for evaluating the risk of future fracture is, of course, uh, bone mineral density uh, as assessment. And in France, in our guidelines, um, we consider that it is useful to assess bone mineral density in all patients. And the reason for that is because if you do that, you are able to evaluate the bone loss that already occurred when the first uh, fracture uh, event is, is there. And it's probably helpful, helpful to decide how you will, you will manage the patient and which kind of treatment you will propose to the, to the patient. Then it's also quite helpful in um, the diagnosis of bone fragility in uh, certain circumstances of uh, fracture, uh, um, especially for uh, fracture of the wrist or uh, fracture of the uh, ankle that could be uh, still traumatic uh, fracture even in uh, elderly uh, uh, patient. The third uh, interest of having a BMD assessment uh, before uh, treatment initiation is that then you have a reference uh, value that will be uh, helpful then for monitoring the patient and to um, be able to understand if the patient uh, responds uh, appropriately to the treatment um, or not. And the fourth um, um, interest of having BMD is that you can also perform VFA at the same time as you uh, assess uh, BMD. And it means that at the same time, you have two fracture risks uh, that are um, available, the BMD value and the number of um, asymptomatic um, prevalent fractures. So we consider that it is useful. Of course, um, if you don't have the opportunity to do that, or if it is uh, difficult to um, make the patient coming to the FLS to uh, measure uh, BMD, then there are many different situations in which you can initiate a treatment without a, a BND, especially if the patient had a severe fracture like uh, a pelvic fracture, a vertebral fracture, and of course, a hip fracture. But we consider that if you can do a BMD, then it's better to do it. And um, uh, what is interesting is BMD, uh, I will go briefly on that, BMD is very helpful to uh, uh, evaluate the risk of a future, a future fracture regarding, regardless of the other uh, um, uh, factors, like, uh, factors like age or uh, previous fracture. Then you have to decide uh, to treat the patient and you can do it uh, simply using the FRAX or uh, other scores. But if you uh, just take a brief look at the uh, right part of the, um, of the slides, you can see that in France, at least, uh, FRAX is not very well used by the, uh, the physicians, 20 that time less than in, in, in the UK. So in our last version of our guidelines, we decided to shift to more uh, clinical approach to um, define which kind of patient uh, should be uh, treated. And um, 
we defined three different situations. The patient that had severe fracture, femur, humerus, vertebra, and, and pelvis. Those who, have, uh, who had non-severe fractures, uh, wrist, uh, uh, rib, uh, ankle, and, and so on. And those who had BMD because they had a risk factor for osteoporosis or risk factor for falls, but no previous uh, fracture. And then we cross that and we plot that with the um, BMD uh, value above minus one, minus or below minus one, below minus two, and below minus three. And depending of the severity of the clinical situation, we consider that um, if the patient had a severe fracture, femur, humerus, vertebra, and pelvis, if the BMD is below minus one, you should treat the patient. If it's above that, you probably need a specialist uh, advice because it's something weird that someone has a, a hip fracture, for example, with a very normal uh, T-score. For a non-severe fracture, the threshold is uh, a little bit harsher, it's minus two. If the patient has a, a, a severe fracture, um, non-severe fracture like wrist or ankle, a T-score minus two, then you have to treat. It's a, it's, if it's above minus one, then it's definitely a traumatic fracture. You don't have to treat. And in the in the middle, it's a gray situation. Then it's a specialist uh, situation. And if there's no uh, previous fracture, then the threshold is minus three. It's if, if it's above minus um, um, one, then there is no treatment needed. If it's between minus two and minus three. Uh, that's where the specialist um, may be uh, helpful. So we clearly define three different situations, those who require treatment, those who uh, do not require treatment, and the gray zone, where FRAX and uh, TBS and all other, or other uh, tools may be uh, helpful to make a, a, a decision. Then um, briefly, uh, what uh, could be uh, used for treating the patient, just having in mind that medications, it's only part of uh, the treatment recommendation you'll give to the patient. Preventing falls is also very important. And there is all other um, um, recommendation you can give to the patient in which the patient is proactive in uh, his uh, own uh, treatment and it's usually helpful for improving uh, uh, adherence to uh, the uh, global uh, therapeutic strategy you, you propose to the, to the patient. Of course, you have to clearly uh, explain to the patient uh, what are the goals and the objectives of the treatment, what are um, the uh, benefit and the risk of the uh, treatment, and the um, FLS visit is definitely a good opportunity to take time to well inform the patient and get his um, uh, engagement in, in, the, um, in your uh, therapeutic uh, proposition. It was easy in the last century where uh, patient and physician were really focused on the efficacy of treatment. And as you're all aware, now it is more difficult. You have to well balance the information you give on efficacy and of, on, on safety, because that's the major concern of the patient. That's the safety of, of, of the drug. Then I will skip all the treatment recommendation we have in our um, um, uh, guidelines in, in, in France. We uh, set up a couple of uh, vignettes saying, for example, that if a patient has a hip fracture, you can propose a Zoll because there is a very good trial uh, demonstrating the efficacy of Zoll in this situation. If you can use uh, first um, a, a pro-formative um, um, drug like uh, teripartite and now romosozumab, um, we don't have yet romosozumab in, in France, it's good to do that first as a sequential uh, treatment, teripartite, and then an anti-resorptive uh, drug. But of course, there's very often limitation in the ability of 
uh, using uh, teripartite. There are in some country, it's uh, out of the pocket for the patients. In France, it is mandatory that the patient has already two prevalent vertebral fractures to get teripartite. And that's why we are uh, really inclined in doing BND and VFA uh, because it's also helpful to make the decision of uh, whether we are able to give teripartite uh, or, or not. Uh, if the BMD level is low when the, the fracture occurs, then it's definitely a situation where uh, we have to think of uh, uh, sequential uh, treatment with teripartite first and then an antiresorptive uh, drug. Or if you can't give uh, teripartite, for example, if in France, if there is no uh, previous uh, or prevalent vertebral fracture, uh, then uh, it's a good opportunity to give uh, DMAB uh, because, uh, as you know, DMAB is very uh, helpful for increasing uh, BMD with the idea that you will bring back uh, BMD above a defined uh, target above minus uh, two. And um, it's part of the inclusion of the uh, treat to target strategy we have in our um, French uh, guideline. Then for the long-term uh, management, uh, I believe that is very important first, uh, right from the beginning, to define the respective roles of the FLS and uh, the GP. Uh, again, because it is very difficult for a lot of FLSs to uh, be in charge of this long-term management, because again, uh, it is uh, uh, very demanding in terms of, uh, of human resources. So if one FLS is not able to uh, uh, run itself the, uh, um, the follow-up of the patient, he has to, uh, it is very uh, um, helpful to coordinate the walls with, with the, the GP. And I briefly show you uh, uh, some data coming from um, uh, a study we did with the, um, the collection of the Capture the Fracture um, program questionnaires of all uh, FLSs that responded to this um, FLS and um, 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 Masaki Fujita uh, um, presented the, this um, at the last uh, IOF uh, uh, meeting. And you can see that uh, among the 322 uh, FLSs that completed the, the, the questionnaire, 86% of them uh, uh, claimed that they uh, did uh, have a, a, a monitoring uh, pathway uh, for the, the follow-up. But then if we carefully um, uh, assess it, the, these um, uh, answers, you can see that actually only two thirds of them were uh, able uh, on their own to um, um, follow the patient for the for the long term, and uh, only ten percent of of them were able to visit the patient twice before six months, and and then on the long term after after twelve months. So again, it's very important to organize that. It's not necessary that uh, the, the patient has to visit again the FLS. It can be through uh, uh, phone calls uh, by the coordinator or uh, communication with, with the GP. And um, uh, coming back to the French guideline, we um, uh, proposed a, a table for all, all kind of different treatments to um, have uh, a list of uh, items that are, uh, have to be uh, uh, evaluated during the, the, the follow-up. There is nothing uh, really um, uh, extraordinary there, but it is uh, very important for us to, to say to uh, GPs that uh, 
Of course, they have to uh, evaluate whether there is new fracture or not, new risk factor or not, adherence and tolerance to the treatment. It is very important to measure eight. Um, we believe it is important to uh, again reevaluate the, uh, the the spine either through a VFA or X-ray if there is uh, eight loss or uh, back, back pain because it is important to be sure that there is no new vertebral fractures. Uh, we recommend to use uh, bone turnover markers uh, at least for patients under uh, anti-resorptive uh, drug and the time frame is uh, related to the um, um, uh, pharmacological uh, response uh, of a bone turnover marker to, to, the, to the different uh, drugs. Um, for most of the, the cases, it's between three and six uh, months. If the patient is not in the target of having a low uh, remodeling rate, then you have to uh, uh, talk again with the patient and uh, see whether he's taking the, the drug appropriately or not, whether he had the injection or not, uh, or um, whether it is a problem of uh, uh, bone that is not responding to um, the uh, treatment that is actually a, a rare situation. And then we believe it is helpful to have a reevaluation of BMD after two to three years to be sure at least that there is no uh, decrease in uh, BMD that would be considered as a failure of, uh, of the treatment. But um, more than that, uh, we believe that at least for the patient that started treatment, uh, having a BMD that was uh, low, it is one of the uh, targets to uh, um, help the patient getting a BMD back uh, above um, minus uh, two as one of the target. And it is helpful for deciding whether you can then make a break in, in, in the treatment. And we set up four conditions for having this kind of break in the treatment. I don't say stopping the treatment, I say break in the, in the treatment. And you can probably do that if there is no fracture in the treatment, no new risk factor, of course, no significant decrease, and uh, a femoral T-score that is above minus uh, two. But it's only a break. And of course, it is mandatory to reevaluate the patient uh, after you have uh, you have done that because osteoporosis is a chronic di disease and if you stop the treatment you'll get back bone loss and you may need sometimes to uh, put the patient back on the treatment. So if I summarize uh, this presentation uh, uh, I have some few uh, items to say. Um, it is very uh, in, important to establish a coordinated pathway for all osteoporotic patients. Of course, it can be an FLS, but it could, can be uh, other uh, kind of uh, coordinate, uh, coordinated uh, organization, um, uh, not only within hospital, but also outside of, of uh, hospitals. Coordination is the key word there. Then you have to uh, be f as fast as possible within a time frame to eight to 12 weeks to assess the level and the imminence of the fr fracture, uh, fracture risk. And uh, if the, uh, um, you uh, initiate a treatment, then you or a, your correspondent, the GPs, uh, that you're working with have to regularly uh, evaluate the, the needs uh, of uh, pursuing the treatment and the ratio between benefits and risk of, of different uh, therapy, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, therapy. And to do that, uh, clearly uh, it's a matter of uh, communication and this communication has to be wide with the GP, with the other healthcare professional, the dentist, the physiotherapist, and the orthopedic surgeon that needs to know that after he fixed the fracture, 
you play uh, an important role for preventing the, the, the second uh, fracture. And just to um, uh, briefly uh, uh, keep you in mind that this is only the prevention of the secondary fracture. And it is not the anterior osteoporosis uh, scope. It is not prevention of the first fracture. And it is not, of course, the prevention of the disease uh, itself. But we are doing so bad at the moment that it's probably the uh, major first goal to achieve to uh, well reduce the risk of the second fracture. And with that, uh, I thank you uh, for your uh, attention and uh, uh, I'm happy to get some uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much, Professor Thoma, for your clear and excellent talk and for covering the patient monitoring strategies following the standards of the best practice framework of capture the fracture. I'm sure the audience uh, appreciate uh, to see the French, the, its implementation in the French health system. And um, uh, now I would like to move on to questions as we have received a number of them during this presentation. So maybe the first one, which is quite uh, a relevant one during this uh, pandemic is like, um, um, is how, to run a FLS and to manage osteoporotic patients during this COVID pandemic? Uh, thank you for this uh, question. It, it gives me the uh, opportunity to stress that um, we um, put together um, a, 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 um, a kind of guideline um, uh, in the um, Capture the Fracture um, program uh, website for uh, um, appropriately answering this uh, question. But it's definitely an issue because in most uh, areas, uh, FLSs are uh, stopped because of the um, COVID the, uh, pandemic, because uh, all the human resources uh physician nurses uh, are, are um giving help in managing uh covid uh, patients so what i can say briefly uh, but again the uh, full answer is in the ctf uh website is that you have to probably postpone the visit to the fls get a kind of a registry of the patient to have a visit later on but these um, is um, with an, an, an additional uh, organization that should be made together with the uh, uh, orthopedic uh, team uh, to uh, give the opportunity to start a treatment uh, right after the, um, the, the patient uh, leaves the uh, orthopedic ward or even if it is possible within the orthopedic world, uh, world, having in mind that there are few uh, contraindications of the uh, of the different uh, osteoporotic treatments that have to be uh, checked, especially um, uh, chronic uh, kidney uh, disease and uh, appropriate level of of calcium and and uh, vitamin D, and then. Um, the um, the best um, uh, selection of, of treatment could be probably uh, treatment um, uh, given by uh, uh, in injection either Zol or or Dimab because it gives you a time for uh, postponing the uh, visit to the FLF, FLS and then adjust the management of of the uh, of the of the patient. Just two quick uh, uh, further comments. Uh, be aware that after all, there can be some um, uh, fever, and in the COVID uh, situation, 
uh, you have to well inform everybody that uh, fever can be related to the first injection of, of Zol. There is no risk of uh, DMAB, at least uh, as we are uh, aware, but if the uh, DMAB treatment is started, then you have to pay attention that the second uh, shot will be appropriately given in, in the next uh, six months. Thank you for this very complete uh, answer. Another very important question is one related to the patient at very high risk of fracture. How, how do you manage them in, t in the context of the FLS? Are they following the same pathway, the same timing of care, or do you handle them differently? If you're able to run an FLS following the, um, the uh, best standard of, of, of care, uh, and uh, when I say that, I mean uh, being able of having everything done within uh, eight weeks following the, uh, the fracture event, there is no reason to change the way that you manage these patients. But if you're not able to, to do it that way, and for example, someone that uh, is very frail with uh, a first uh, hip fracture that required uh, treatment uh, very soon, and you're not able to um, um, organize a visit to the FLS um, in a short period of time, then of course it's like almost in, like in the COVID situation, you have to uh, very rapidly uh, start the treatment if you can, and if there is no uh, contraindication, that you have of course to check that. But then everything else can be uh, uh, done uh, later on uh, in terms of uh, um, BMD. But again, the BMD is not mandatory in every uh, situation and of course uh, the full um, prevention but that that can be done um, after the patient uh, has uh, performed his uh, rehabilitation or sometimes during the rehabilitation. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding uh, you know like uh, the roles of the different uh, members of the of an FLS. Um, in terms of the care and the follow-up of the patient, you did not mention like geriatrician or nutritionist. Do you consider them as important or to be part of the team, or are they less are they less prior prior? It's it's less a priority. Um, it it really uh, I think it's a case to case situation. It really depends. Who runs the um, the uh, uh, FLS? Uh, which kind of patients uh, are managed by the FLS? If it's um, we have very often uh, FLSs that are uh, within uh, geriatric uh, uh, departments, and uh, I think it, it is very uh, appropriate for um, most uh, patients. When I, I said uh, bone specialists, it, it can be a rheumatologist, it can be an endocrinologist, it can be geriatrician, uh, or it can be a combination uh, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the different uh, spe specialties, um, having in mind the age of the patient, the comorbidities, and, and, and so forth. So definitely, in one FLS, you can have uh, these different uh, um, um, uh, knowledge coming from the different uh, specialty. That's what is interesting in managing patients uh, with osteoporosis. But it's also what is, is uh, difficult because many different healthcare professionals have to be involved in, in the management of the patient including a uh, uh, nutritionist, uh, as you, you said. Of course, if the patient is uh, 60 
uh, five uh, years old uh, woman in a healthy uh, condition with a first vertebral fracture. Uh, maybe even a rheumatologist is able to uh, uh, evaluate if uh, she has uh, appropriate uh, nutrition. But if it's someone quite old uh, with sarcopenia and, and, and so forth, uh, living alone uh, um, at home, then the help of a nutritionist is very uh, helpful. Again, it's the, probably the role of the healthcare professional, regardless of uh, his uh, competence, the role of this person that visits the patient at the FLS to, to briefly get a touch on the risk of fall, risk of uh, poor nutrition and, and so forth and say, well, for this specific patient, uh, beside uh, initiating drug, uh, I need to uh, um, um, give uh, a better nutrition. So I need a nutritionist assessment. I need the help of a physiotherapist. Um, or uh, uh, I need the, the help of uh, an endocrinologist and, and, and so forth. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry. Another question also related to the FLS and uh, in parallel with the healthcare. Uh, people are asking uh, whether there, if there is a, a way of reporting fracture and uh, if there is a system of uh, generating a kind of a database with all the fracture in parallel with the FLS visit. So if I take our, our example, we have uh, uh, an electronic uh, patient file and we have uh, a standardized um, FLS file for patients that visit our department within the organization of the FLS. And then uh, uh, from this uh, standardized um, FLS file, we are able to automatically extract the um, um, uh, useful information to our database. So it's our example, and I know, I know uh, uh, many others uh, have done the same uh, the, the same thing. In the in the first years of our FLS, we were doing that uh, manually, and that was the um, FLS coordinator that was uh, in charge of doing this uh, um, painful uh, job. Uh, of course, is easier and more accurate to do that uh, through uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, transfer from uh, files to database. What is also very, very important, and I hope it will come in, in the uh, next uh, future for uh, uh, all of us, is all these um, uh, word uh, identification uh, softwares that will be able to identify in, in, in patient files all the keywords that will help us to identify all patients that we are not identified either at the OR or at the uh, ER, especially those who uh, uh, have um, um, prevalent asymptomatic vertebral fracture that are uh, identified through uh, CT or uh, MRI performed for uh, other uh, medical reasons. Thank you. And maybe one uh, last question as, uh, you know, time is running. Uh, I'm sorry for the other one. We get, we collected many questions, but it's not possible to answer all of them. But may, maybe, sorry, a final one. Uh, in case of vitamin D deficiency found during the hip fracture management, uh, do you have a special, do you recommend a special protocol to reload uh, before starting uh, the lindronic or treatment, for example? Yeah, it is, it is important to do that. And uh, uh, it really depends um, uh, the level of, of vitamin D um, when you uh, uh, evaluate the patient. If it's really a, a full deficiency, 
with uh, vitamin D that is uh, below uh, 10 uh, nanogram per mil, then um, our uh, protocol is um, um, uh, 50,000 units per week. And um, um, you have to do that for uh, three to four weeks. And then you have to reevaluate after four weeks what is your uh, next level of, of vitamin D. And if you're back to normal or subnormal uh, level between 20 and, and 30 nanogram per meal, then you can continue the uh, vitamin D supplementation at a more uh, physiological uh, level, like 50,000 uh, per month, for example. And, and you, you, can, uh, you can give the first uh, Zol uh, shot. If it's someone that is uh, between, let's say, uh, 15 to 20 nanogram per meal, then you can probably give uh, one or two uh, um, um, 50,000 uh, uh, units um, uh, of vitamin D, one or two weeks um, in, in a row. And then after two weeks, you're almost certain that your uh, level of vitamin D is appropriate. So that you can give the, uh, the, the Zol and uh, continue with vitamin D supplementation at a physiological uh, level. Thank you for answering all these uh, important questions from our audience. Now, I would like to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. And uh, we hope that you enjoy this session. We will post recordings of this webinar on the IOF website, and you will also receive it by link. Uh, you will also receive the link by email tomorrow. Um, you will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar, and we would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. And last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send uh, them over to webinar at iofbonehealth.org. Uh, and uh, I re really would like to thank you again, Professor Thomas, for this uh, excellent talk and for, and for answering all these important questions. And uh, I would like to say goodbye to everybody. To, I wish you a good day or a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, participation and uh, uh, to all, uh, stay safe. Yeah, stay safe to all of you. Bye. Bye.